Christmas caroling with some of the members here at Trinity. Uh, they're going to be meeting here at 245 and then going caroling to some of the local nursing homes. And again, uh, yeah, don't, don't have to be a professional singer if you enjoy singing or just enjoy having fun. Uh, you, you can uh, join us uh, in singing Christmas carols. As you leave this morning, um, the ushers are going to be handing you an invitation card for uh, our spiritual growth path. So two years ago, we started our spiritual growth path. You may remember that, how we started with the Knowing Jesus Bible Information class. And so we've gone all the way through around all the bases with the spiritual growth path, and now we're starting over again. So in January, we're going to be starting with the uh, Knowing Jesus Bible Information class again. We encourage everybody, especially if you haven't uh, gone to the class uh, recently, uh, we encourage you to attend, invite somebody to attend with you to learn the truths about Jesus our Savior, to review the truths that you learned uh, many years ago in Bible information class. The um, classes will be held on Sunday mornings at 1045 and then also Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And like I said, the ushers will hand, uh, hand these out as you leave this morning, take one along and invite somebody to come to those classes with you. As I mentioned last uh, week, uh, throughout the month of December, our stewardship committee is uh, conducting a special stewardship drive. And uh, in connection with that, if you use an envelope that's not from your packet, if you don't use that green one that I mentioned you know, last week, um, whatever envelope you use, be sure to write your envelope number on it so they know who to credit the, don no the donation to. I think that's everything. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. And uh, in our service today, we focus on the words of the prophet Isaiah as he prepares us for the coming of our Lord, for the Lord of glory. Our service that we're following is printed in your service folder. It will also be up on the screens if you'd like to follow along there. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, throughout the centuries, you sent messengers to prepare your people for your coming. As we gather in your house today, prepare our hearts through the message of your word. Lead us to humbly confess our sins and lead us to look to you as our deliverer, the one who comes to set us free. In your name we pray, amen. So our first song is an instrumental song. There will be words up on the screen, but those words are for meditation.
We worship in the name of our glorious and gracious God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we approach our holy God in worship, let us humbly confess our sins. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake.
Friends, I'm happy to tell you that redemption has won. Through His Son, our Savior Jesus, God has conquered sin and conquered death, and He provided rest and peace for our souls. For His sake, I assure you that your sins are all forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our next song. scripture lesson this morning is recorded in the Gospel of St. Mark, Mark chapter 1, the first eight verses. In these verses, Mark describes the work of John the Baptist, the one who was sent to prepare the way for the coming Savior. Beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who, prepa who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, 
baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. He will baptize you with water. I will, excuse me, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends our scripture lesson. We'll continue then with our next song. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 40. Those words are printed in your service folder if you'd like to follow along. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. 
Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged place is a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus Christ, our coming Lord and Savior, the fellow children of God. Who is it that is coming to your place this Christmas? Is it Grandpa and Grandma Anderson? Is it uh, Uncle Fred and Aunt Esther? Is it your sister and her family from South Bend or maybe your cousins from Wisconsin? And what are you doing to prepare for their coming? Are you cleaning out the guest room? Are you buying and wrapping lots of presents? Are you preparing for a special meal? No matter who it is that is coming to your place this Christmas, there is one person that is coming to all of our homes. Very important guest. As Isaiah reminds us this morning in the verse of our, of our text, the Lord is coming. The Lord of glory. And he also tells us what we should do to prepare for his coming. And the first part of that is to listen to his gracious comfort. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are the law message of his book. In them, Isaiah proclaims a stern message of of repentance and, and judgment. He rebukes the people of Israel for their many sins, especially for their sin of idolatry. And he announces God's judgment. That soon the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people would be carried off into captivity. Starting in chapter 40, though, the the tone of Isaiah's message changes dramatically. In those chapters, instead of speaking to the people of Israel as a whole, he's, he's speaking to the faithful remnant. The people of Israel and the people of Judah who had remained faithful to the Lord their God, but who one day would be living in exile in Babylon. So yes, in the second part of his verse, Isaiah is speaking about a time that is still off in the future. A time when the kingdom of of Israel would be destroyed. A time when the city of Jerusalem and, and the temple of God would be lying in ruins and the people themselves would be living in captivity. At that time, the people would not need a message of impending judgment. They would be living it. At that time, the people wouldn't need a reminder of their sins because day by day, they would be living a daily reminder of the consequences of their sins. Instead, at that point, God's people would need comfort and encouragement. So that's the way Isaiah begins the second portion of his book, with a message of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. No more message of judgment and and stern warning, God says to Isaiah. No more message of of repentance and rebuke. Now it's time to comfort my people. Now it's time to encourage them and lift them up with the sweet and comforting message of, of forgiveness. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. As far as God was concerned, there Years of service for their sins were completed now. Their hard years of toil and labor in the penitentiary of captivity were done. It was finished. It was over. That her sins had been paid for. 
Notice that that is a passive verb. Yes, their sins had been paid for, but they were not the ones who had made the payment. Seventy years in captivity would never be enough to atone for their sins of idolatry and rebellion against God. No, someone else had made a payment for their sins. A double payment, a perfect payment. The Messiah. The coming Savior, He is the one who had made that payment. Isaiah describes Him later on in chapter 53 this way. He says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. Yes, the Lord was coming. The Lord of glory. In the light of His coming, Isaiah was to proclaim a message of comfort to God's people. The comfort and peace of forgiveness. That's the same message Isaiah proclaims to you and me today. A message of comfort message of forgiveness. You see, we too are just as guilty as the people of Israel. Like the people of Israel, we too are guilty of rebellion and idolatry. Loving God less than ourselves. Loving God less than our things. And we too are deserving of God's punishment. To spend Time in captivity far more than 70 years. And spend the rest of forever in exile and hell. But wait. God has a different message for us today. A message of comfort. A message of forgiveness. The hard service for our sins has been completed. No, we didn't serve that time. Somebody else did in our place. Our sins have all been paid for. Again, not that we made the payment, somebody else did. Savior Jesus. On the cross, Jesus offered a double payment, a perfect payment for all of our sins. And in light of that, you and I don't need to be afraid. We have nothing to fear as we wait for the coming of our our Lord on that last day because our sins are forgiven and we are at peace with God. As you prepare for the coming of your Lord this Christmas, be sure to listen to his message of comfort. Secondly, be sure to prepare his desert highway. Again, Isaiah says, A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. Rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Just as Isaiah foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of God's people, so he also foretold their future deliverance. One day the Lord would come to their aid. He would deliver them from captivity and bring them back to the land of Israel. Normally, when someone would travel from Israel over to the land of Babylon, they would follow the trade route that went up and around along the Fertile Crescent and around the Arabian Desert. But not God. Here, God is described as being so eager and so ready to deliver His people that He takes the direct route right through the desert. Of course, there are no highways in the desert, so a little road work needs to be done first. Fill in the valleys. Tear down the mountains and hills. Make a nice, smooth highway for the Lord because He's coming to deliver His people. It was a picturesque way of describing what actually happened. When the 70 years of captivity were over and it was time for God to come and deliver His people, the Lord wasted no time. He brought the kingdom of Babylon to an end just like that. They were conquered by the Medes and the Persians. And then in the very first year of his reign, God moved King Cyrus to announce a, an amazing decree. God's people were free. Free to return home. Free to return to the land of Israel. 
That time of deliverance was a preview of another time of deliverance. A time when the Lord would come again to deliver His people, to rescue them from the captivity to sin and death. That time is the time Mark tells us about in his gospel. The time when Jesus came. And in order to prepare His people for His coming, Jesus sent a messenger ahead of Him to prepare the way. That messenger, of course, was John the Baptist. John prepared the people of his day by, by proclaiming a message of repentance, by tearing down the, the mountains and hills of pride and self-righteousness in people's hearts. He also filled in the valleys by pointing people to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away their sins, and baptizing them for the forgiveness of their sins. As we today wait for the coming of our Lord, as we wait for the day when our Lord is finally going to come and deliver us from sin and death forever, we need to prepare in the same way. We too need the bulldozer of God's law to tear down the mountains and hills of pride and self-righteousness in our hearts. No matter how good we are or how good we think we are in comparison to others, we are not good enough for God. We are sinful, and without a Savior, we'd, we'd be lost. Likewise, we also need the dump truck of the gospel to come and fill in the valleys in our hearts. Fill in the valleys with God's grace and mercy and, and forgiveness. You see, Satan would like to lead us to despair. He would like to lead us to believe that the things that we have done are so bad and, and so awful that they, they could never be forgiven. God has a different message for us. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. As you prepare for the coming of your Lord this Christmas, be sure to prepare a nice smooth path for Him, a nice smooth highway into your heart. So obviously this was a wonderful message that Isaiah was proclaiming. A message of comfort and encouragement and, and hope for God's people, but could they really believe it? Especially in light of all the doom and gloom that Isaiah proclaimed in the first half of his book. Could they believe, as they were sitting there in captivity in Babylon, that their sins really had been paid for? That God really was going to come and deliver them someday? God gives them the answer in verses 6 through 8. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. When it comes right down to it, you and I aren't much better than the toys that we gave our, our children for Christmas, are we? They had their day of glory. They got played with for, you know, a week or two or maybe a month, but now, you know, they're somewhere at the bottom of the toy box. You and I are a lot like the, the flowers of the field that bloomed so beautifully this past summer, but now they're dry and barren and lifeless. We don't last, do we? We're here 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, maybe 80 if God gives us the strength, but before long our strength begins to fade, our glory fades away, and before we know it, we're gone. We don't last. It's even true of someone like the prophet Isaiah. In fact, by the time the, the people in, who were living in captivity in Babylon read his words, the words we read this morning, Isaiah had already been dead for almost a hundred years. So how could they know that his words would come true? How could they know that God would really come and deliver them? Because his words were not just his words. 
They were God's words. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And God's words are not like people. People come and go, but the word of our God stands forever. Aren't you glad that the message of the Bible doesn't depend on human beings? Aren't you glad that the message of salvation doesn't depend on people like myself or Pastor Italiano? Pastors don't last either, do they? We're, we too are like the grass, and before you know it, we're gone. But God's Word is never gone. God's Word lasts forever. And that's where you can place your confidence. You can be sure, absolutely sure, that your Lord has come and, and paid for all of your sins because the Word of our God stands forever. Likewise, you can be sure, absolutely sure, that your Lord will come one day and deliver you forever from sin and death and all the effects of sin because the Word of our God stands forever. As you're preparing for your guests this year, be sure to prepare for the most important guest of all, your Lord, the Lord of glory. Listen to his gracious comfort. Prepare a nice smooth road for him, highway into your heart, and believe his everlasting word. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with the gathering of our offerings.
Please stand for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of glory, we thank you for the message of comfort and peace that you proclaimed through messengers like Isaiah and recorded for us on the pages of the Bible. We rejoice that you came to deliver us from bondage to sin and death, that you completed the hard service for our sins and, and paid for them all with your suffering and death on the cross. Fill our hearts with your comfort and peace this Advent season as we prepare for your coming. And bless our efforts to share that message of comfort with our family and friends and neighbors and with people all around the world that they too might be prepared for your coming. We ask your comfort, Lord, on behalf of the family and friends of Eric Seeley, the grandson of Bob and Julie Seeley, who was killed in a tragic accident this past week. Help them to find comfort and peace and strength in you and, and your unfailing love. We also ask your blessing, Lord, on Jeff Ullenbrock, Wendy Fisher, and Nate Krug as they have accepted calls to serve at other schools. Bless them as they continue their service to your children and your people here at Illinois Lutheran for the rest of this school year. And bless them as they also prepare for the new area of ministry that you have called them to. We ask your blessing, Lord, on the ministry of Branch Lutheran Schools in Haiti. Bless the work of the teachers and staff members as they seek to proclaim the good news of peace and forgiveness and hope in Jesus to the children and the people of Haiti. And Lord, we also thank you, along with Matt and Jessica Biesterfeld, who were blessed with a healthy baby girl, Vivian Rose, recently. We thank you for watching over mom and baby and bringing them safely through delivery. We also ask that you would watch over their little one and keep her safe in your care until she can also be brought into your family through the waters of holy baptism. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Hear us, Lord, and grant our requests in keeping with your good and gracious will. And hear us as we also pray the prayer you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appears. Jesse free your own from Satan's tyranny from depths of hell your people save and bring them victory o'er the spring from on high 
cheer us by your drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to Uh, Mr. Lee Peterson, the chairman of uh, Branch Lutheran Schools, with us today, and he's going to give us an update on the mission work in Haiti. Good. Well, good morning. I'm Lee Peterson. Uh, my wife Linda's in the back corner there. We're from Mount Olive Lutheran in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I have the privilege of serving as the chair of Branch Lutheran Schools of Haiti. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about that for a few minutes. I know that I'm standing between you and coffee and donuts and breakfast and, and the rest of your day. So I'll, I'll keep this short. Uh, Branch Lutheran Schools of Haiti is uh, the nonprofit that is uh, funding the orphanage and Christian day school ministry in Haiti. If you need a little refresher on your geography, Haiti is in the Caribbean. Uh, it shares the island of Hispanola with the uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, fortunately, they were spared during the 2017 uh, hurricane season, but not true for the 2016 hurricane season. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. The big change that happened and, and really what initiated the wells getting involved was the, the earthquake in 2010. The epicenter of that earthquake was uh, southwest of Port-au-Prince and somewhere between 100 and 300,000 people were killed. It was a devastating earthquake. The reason there's such a wide range in the, in the count of people is that the records, the census records were destroyed as well. So there really isn't a clear understanding of how many people lived there. 
Uh, <clears throat> the devastation, though, was tremendous. And you saw this all in the news, and, and many people donated, I know. But just, just look at, at the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of homes that were destroyed. The presidential palace was also destroyed. That isn't this image, but led to a lot of despair. It led to uh, uh, Wells Christian Aid and Relief getting involved. Uh, I also mentioned hurricanes. The, the 2016 hurricane season did, one of the hurricanes did strike uh, Haiti and caused a lot of damage. The other thing in the lives of Haitians uh, is voodoo. It's a, uh, uh, people know the name. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dark sort of um, religion that, that people assume uh, the, the people who practice, it, it bridges the gap between the, the living world and the dead world. Uh, it's it's um, in, in people's lives a lot in Haiti. Uh, of course, it came from Africa, and, and so it's, it's another thing that, that uh, people in, in Haiti have to deal with. So I mentioned that the Wells uh, Christian Aid and Relief got involved after the earthquake. They started working with 12 orphanages and, and did did relief, provided money. Of those 12 orphanages, three of the directors were interested in becoming Lutheran, and the, the Wells National Pastor plus a missionary from the U.S. worked with them, and ultimately that led to those directors being confirmed and the start of three Christian day schools at three orphanages. And praise the Lord, now there are 400 orphans and neighborhood children attending those three Christian day schools. I'll tell you a little bit about each one. Uh, one of the orphanages, Director Buzico, uh, he's got 30 orphans and 67 students. He's in Carrefour. Uh, Yvette is in Smyrn, and she has 25 orphans and 287 students. And because she has a little more land, that's also where a job training um, uh, classrooms have been established with some grants from, from another source. And finally, in Laogon is Jeannot. He's the director of that orphanage and school. He's got 46 or orphans and 58 students. Here's some pictures of those. Um, this happens to be a vet school. They all wear uniforms at a vet school. Uh, this year, for the first time, we were able to afford workbooks for the children. So the, the orphans um, were, were providing those workbooks. The, the, the neighborhood kids that come to the orphanage, orphanage schools, their parents provide the, for their workbooks. I wish I'd have blown this picture up a little bit, but it's a key point here. If you if you got really sharp eyes, you can see that those kids in, in the front table there have huge, huge heaps of food on their plate. And I'm going to talk to you later about the nutrition problems in Haiti. And you'd think if you saw this picture, well, there can't be nutrition problems. Look at that huge heap of food. Well, it turns out that, that they cannot afford to buy the charcoal to heat the water, to, to boil the water to make rice more than once a day. So the, the orphans get one meal a day, and it's a huge pile of beans and rice, and that's basically their diet. Um, we are able uh, and have been able since uh, this spring to fund nu nutrition assistance for the orphanages as, as well. So that puts some fruits and vegetables in their diet. <clears throat> but just imagine you eat once a day because you can't afford the fuel to heat the water to make the rice. Just shows how bad things really are in Haiti. So about BLSH, we're a parasynodical organization. We uh, incorporated in uh, 2015 in Minnesota. We got IRS 501c3 status in 2016. Uh, we have a seven-member board of directors, again, of which I'm the chair. And we took over funding of these orphanage schools uh, from the Wells in 2015. So we have now been uh, funding the, the schools for 25 months. So what's our end goal? Of course, it's the Great Commission. You heard about that in the um, Wells Connection. And, of course, the traditional mission starts with a, a nucleus of adult believers with, you know, possibly families. Well, that's not the situation where we are with the orphanage schools in Haiti. Our situation is different. We're starting with a nucleus of the orphans and the directors, and we're building from that to the schools and to the neighborhoods, neighborhood children. And those neighborhood children, of course, involve their parents in the schools, and the end result is that that's how we see this ministry growing into, uh, you know, into 
satisfying the, the needs of the Great Commission. The schools provide both a, a spiritual and a secular education, and, um, and of course we're providing humanitarian needs for the, for the first time this spring. But we are clear that we fund the schools, we don't operate the schools. We don't have the manpower or the people on the ground in Haiti to do any more than fund. We uh, have a national pastor who's watching over. Uh, we have a missionary from the, the U.S. that goes down a few times a year. But we, we you know, to, to kind of guide and, and observe, but it is the directors who are operating these schools. And we're providing for the spiritual, uh, educational, physical, uh, and emotional needs of, of these children in the schools. We fund the teachers, classrooms. Uh, we provide water for one, <coughs> one orphanage, uh, nutrition assistance I mentioned, medical, sanitation, job training, and, and some other things. <coughs> the critical reason that I'm involved in this ministry is after my first visit there. I visited at about the same time Hurricane Sandy was, um, was going through the Caribbean. I think that was in 2011. And I went to Buzico's orphanage with uh, missionary Terry Schultz. And while I was there for about four hours, I saw about 10 or 15 kids ranging in age from three or four years old to about 12 or 13 years old. And the whole time of my visit, all four hours, those kids sat on a bench and didn't move. And I, and I didn't understand at first. I thought, wow, what, what well-behaved children. You know, they've had this really harsh life, they're orphans, and to be so well-behaved sitting there on those, on those benches. It turns out that they didn't have the energy to do anything else. They were so dehydrated and so malnourished that all they could do was sit on those benches for four hours. They didn't have the energy to do anything else. Imagine that context with American children that are well nourished and hydrated. How could you get American children to sit still for four hours? It's, it's close to unimaginable, but for these orphans, it wasn't unmanageable. Today, things are different. First, the funding from Christian Aid and Relief and now from BLSH, that the children are, are well nourished, maybe not as good as Americans, but well nourished, uh, hydrated, and there's a lot of joy and happiness in their lives. And the change that I saw is why I continue to be involved in, in this ministry. So the opportunities there are really endless. God has opened the doors for us to serve. Uh, and it's really also a testament to the deplorable conditions in Haiti. But the opportunities, even though they're, they're, they're limitless, we're really challenged by the resources. We need human resources and we, we need funding. Some human resource, well, I'll get to the human resources. The teachers um, cost $200 a month. Um, nutrition assistance is $200 per orphanage per month. Uh, the cistern water we're providing for one orphanage is $150. We're providing rent for one orphanage. We have 28 teachers and directors total serving the 400 kids. So that adds up to a little under $6,800 per month. And when you average it all out, it costs $17 per child per month to, to uh, operate these uh, three Christian day schools. So we really need your prayers. We need your prayers of thanksgiving for the success of this ministry, for the strength uh, of the board and the tremendous number of volunteers we have. Uh, we hope and, and pray that you remember uh, us in your prayers. Uh, we really need two professionals. We need a lawyer with some insight into the nonprofit world, and we could really use a development person that helps us. Um, you know, th some of us, like me personally, I'm an engineer. I just go around and talk. Uh, I think a development person would really do a much better job than me, so w we do need some professionals. Um, a lot of congregations and a lot of individuals are supporting a teacher for, for the long term. That's another suggestion. Uh, providing nutrition assistance would, would be another possibility. And uh, as Pastor mentioned, there uh, is the, uh, the fish the fish bowl um, place to give uh, out in the hallway. Plus, we, we have some uh, holiday gift items and, and other items set up in the east part of the fellowship hall. 
And, and as you probably know, BLSH is Trinity's uh, mission uh, commitment for this year. So thank you for your prayers and encouragement. Uh, thank you for the invitation, invitation to come and speak to you today. Our uh, URL for our website is there. Uh, Linda and I are going to hang around uh, in, the, in the area where the items are in the fellowship hall to answer any questions you have. And, and again, thanks again for the invitation.